Section 29 of The Pink Fairy Book. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elliot Miller. The Pink Fairy Book by Andrew Lang. The Sprig of Rosemary. Quintos Papalars Catalans Pulo Dr. Francisco de S. Marpons Vailabrus. Barcelona, Liberia de Don Alvar Veguedar, 1885. Once upon a time there lived a man with one daughter, and he made her work hard all the day. One morning, when she had finished everything he had set her to do, he told her to go out into the woods and get some dry leaves and sticks to kindle a fire. The girl went out and soon collected a large bundle, and then she plucked at a sprig of sweet-smelling rosemary for herself. But the harder she pulled, the firmer seemed the plant and at last, determined not to be beaten, she gave one great tug, and the rosemary remained in her hands. Then she heard a voice close to her saying, Well? And turning she saw before her a handsome young man, who asked why she had come to steal his firewood. The girl, who felt much confused, only managed to stammer out as an excuse that her father had sent her. Very well, replied the young man. Then come with me. So he took her through the opening made by the torn-up root, and they travelled till they reached a beautiful palace, splendidly furnished, but only lighted from the top. And when they had entered he told her that he was a great lord, and that never had he seen a maiden so beautiful as she, and that if she would give him her heart they would be married and live happily for ever after. And the maiden said, Yes, she would and so they were married. The next day the old dame who looked after the house handed her all the keys, but pointed her out one that she would do well never to use, for if she did the whole palace would fall to the ground, and the grass would grow over it, and the damsel herself would be remembered no more. The bride promised to be careful, but in a little while, when there was nothing left for her to do, she began to wonder what could be in the chest which was opened by the key. As everybody knows, if we once begin to think, we soon begin to do, and it was not very long before the key was no longer in the maiden's hand, but in the lock of her chest. But the lock was stiff and resisted all her efforts, and in the end she had to break it. And what was inside, after all? Why, nothing but a serpent's skin, which her husband, who was unknown to her, a magician, put on when he was at work and at the sight of it the girl was turning away in disgust, when the earth shook violently under her feet, the palace vanished as if it had never been, and the bride found herself in the middle of a field, not knowing where she was or whither to go. She burst into a flood of bitter tears, partly at her own folly, but more for the loss of her husband, whom she dearly loved. Then, breaking a sprig of rosemary off a bush hard by, she resolved, cost what it might, to seek him through the world till she found him. So she walked and she walked and she walked, till she arrived at a house built of straw. And she knocked at the door, and asked if they wanted a servant. The mistress said she did, and if the girl was willing she might stay. But day by day the poor maiden grew more and more sad, till at last her mistress begged her to say what was the matter. Then she told her story, how she was going through the world seeking after her husband. And the mistress answered her, Where he is none can tell better than the sun, the moon, and the wind, for they go everywhere. On hearing these words the damsel set forth once more, and walked till she reached the golden castle, where lived the sun. And she knocked boldly at the door, saying, All hail, O sun! I have come to ask if, of your charity, you will help me in my need. By my own fault I have fallen into these straits, and I am weary, for I seek my husband through the wide world. Indeed, spoke the son, do you, rich as you are, need help? But though you live in a palace without windows, the sun enters everywhere, and he knows you. Then the bride told him the whole story, and did not hide her own ill-doing, and the son listened and was sorry for her and though he could not tell her where to go, he gave her a nut, and bid her open it in a time of great distress. 
The damsel thanked him with all her heart, and departed, and walked and walked and walked, till she came to another castle, and knocked at the door which was opened by an old woman. "'All hail,' said the girl. "'I have come, of your charity, to ask your help.' "'It is my mistress the moon you seek. I will tell her of your prayer.' So the moon came out, and when she saw the maiden she knew her again, for she had watched her sleeping both in the cottage and in the palace, and she spake to her and said, "'Do you, rich as you are, need help?' Then the girl told her the whole story, and the moon listened, and felt sorry for her, and though she could not tell her where to find her husband, she gave her an almond, and told her to crack it when she was in great need. So the damsel thanked her and departed, and walked and walked and walked till she came to another castle, and she knocked at the door and said, All hail! I have come to ask if, of your charity, you will help me in my need. It is my lord the wind that you want, answered the old woman who opened it. I will tell him of your prayer. And the wind looked on her and knew her again for he had seen her in the cottage and in the palace, and he spake to her and said, Do you, rich as you are, want help? And she told him the whole story, and the wind listened, and was sorry for her, and he gave her a walnut that she was to eat in time of need. But the girl did not go as the wind expected. She was tired and sad, and knew not where to turn. So she began to weep bitterly. The wind wept too for company, and said, Don't be frightened. I will go and see if I can find out something. And the wind departed with a great noise and fuss, and in the twinkling of an eye he was back again, beaming with delight. From what one person and another have let fall, he exclaimed. I have contrived to learn that he is in the palace of the king, who keeps him hidden, lest any one should see him, and that to-morrow he is to marry the princess, who, ugly creature that she is, has not been able to find any man to wed her. Who can tell the despair which seized the poor maiden when she heard this news? As soon as she could speak, she implored the wind to do all he could to get the wedding put off for two or three days, for it would take her all that time to reach the palace of the king. The wind gladly promised to do what he could, and as he travelled much faster than the maiden, he soon arrived at the palace, where he found five tailors working night and day at the wedding clothes of the princess. Down came the wind right in the middle of their lace and satin and trimmings of pearl. Away they all went, whish, through the open windows, right up into the tops of the trees, across the river, among the dancing ears of corn. After them raced the tailors, catching, jumping, climbing, but all to no purpose. The lace was torn, the satin stained, the pearls knocked off. There was nothing for it but to go to the shops to buy fresh, and begin all over again. It was plainly quite impossible that the wedding clothes could be ready next day. However, the king was much too anxious to see his daughter married to listen to any excuses, and he declared that a dress must be put together somehow for the bride to wear. But when he went to look at the princess, she was such a figure that he agreed that it would be unfitting for her position to be seen in such a gown and he ordered the ceremony and the banquet to be postponed for a few hours, so that the tailors might take the dress to pieces and make it fit. But by this time the maiden had arrived, footsore and weary at the castle, and as soon as she reached the door she cracked her nut and drew out of it the most beautiful mantle in the world. Then she rang the bell and asked, "'Is not the princess to be married to-day?' "'Yes, she is.' Ask her if she would like to buy this mantle. And when the princess saw the mantle she was delighted, for her wedding mantle had been spoilt with all the other things, and it was too late to make another. So she told the maiden to ask what price she would, and should it be given her. The maiden fixed a large sum, many pieces of gold, 
but the princess had set her heart on the mantle and gave it readily. Now the maiden hid her gold in the pocket of her dress and turned away from the castle. The moment she was out of sight she broke her almond and drew from it the most magnificent petticoats that ever were seen. Then she went back to the castle and asked if the princess wished to buy any petticoats. No sooner did the princess cast her eyes on the petticoats than she declared that they were even more beautiful than the mantle and that she would give the maiden whatever price she wanted for them. And the maiden named many pieces of gold, which the princess paid her gladly. So pleased was she with her new possessions. Then the girl went down the steps where none could watch her and cracked her walnut, and out came the most splendid court dress that any dressmaker had ever invented, and carrying it carefully in her arms she knocked at the door and asked if the princess wished to buy a court dress. When the message was delivered the princess sprang to her feet with delight, for she had been thinking that, after all, it was not much use to have a lovely mantle and elegant petticoats if she had no dress, and she knew the tailors would never be ready in time, so she sent at once to say she would buy the dress, and what sum did the maiden want for it? This time the maiden answered that the price of the dress was the permission to see the bridegroom. The princess was not at all pleased when she heard the maiden's reply, but, as she could not do without the dress, she was forced to give in, and contented herself with thinking that, after all, it did not matter much. So the maiden was led to the rooms which had been given to her husband, and when she came near she touched him with the sprig of rosemary that she carried, and his memory came back, and he knew her, and kissed her, and declared that she was his true wife, and that he loved her and no other. Then they went back to the maiden's home, and grew to be very old, and lived happily all the days of their life. End of The Sprig of Rosemary Recording by Elliot Miller www.voiceofe.com